This is my father's number on the 39. So please stand, please. <laughs> Well, we don't do an awful lot, but I have to some good words in this one. Some good words in my own words. <laughs>
Beautiful song. Beautiful singing. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started this morning. Our Father, we thank you, Lord God, for a sweet reminder once again. <coughs> at the end of the road here, we're going to be with you. And we're going to be with you for eternity. In all your glory, and I pray this morning that you'll help us, Lord, to just make a middle note, Lord, and a commitment in our spirit that we're going to live life now in view of the glory that awaits us. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. And I pray that you would consecrate me to your service this morning by that same blood and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be used. I pray, Amen. God, that you'll give me that door of utterance. Lord, open it to me that I may preach with the right spirit. These folks that have come to hear from you, Lord, will do just that. Help us to be strengthened in our faith and our hands strengthened for this word. And Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, we pray for their soul today and against whatever Satan is using to blind their minds from the gospel. We ask you, Lord, to show them themselves, help them to realize the danger they're in, and the only hope of salvation being in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in His name. Amen. Amen. Open your Bible to the book of Romans once again, and go to Romans chapter 8 once again. Thank God for the book of Romans. Amen. Thank God for the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Amen. Amen. There's just so much here uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit and pertaining to spiritual living. And today's message is going to be the 14th message from the book of Romans here on Sunday mornings. And it's actually the third message from this chapter. And believe me, that's still cutting it way short because there's so much more to say. And uh, it's impossible to get exhausted when it comes to truth uh, that is revealed to us in this chapter alone. And just speaking of spiritual living, I, I've covered already matters of the deliverance that you experience uh, through spirit, spiritual living, uh, which is the deliverance not only from the condemnation of sin, but also from the control of sin, uh, from the sentence of sin and the slavery to sin. You know, before I was saved, I had no choice. Uh, I was a sinner and my soul was connected to this flesh and Everything I did in the sight of God was wrong. The Bible says even the prayer of the wicked is an abomination in His sight. I couldn't pray. I couldn't be religious. Nothing I did could please the Lord. But now, by the grace of God, I've got a choice. And I, I, can, I can choose that I'm not going to be a servant to sin. And I can serve the Lord through uh, yielding my members as instruments to righteousness as through Calvary's cross by that invisible operation. The Bible tells me that the body of sin has been destroyed that I might not serve sin, and sin should not have dominion over me. And then I preached to you about the differences of spiritual living, uh, namely talking about the results of those who live after the Spirit and those who live after uh, carnality or after the flesh. That is, the, the results are the difference. Uh, the Bible talks about life and peace coming to those who are after, they're going after uh, the Spirit of God. And uh, what results from those that go after the flesh and the things of this world is simply death. Yeah. And there's a great difference in being someone who's saved and knows the Lord and wants to follow after Jesus Christ and do as the Bible has commanded us to do, uh, to lay hold on eternal life yeah. as we've been called to do, which is just a military phrase dealing with building up a stronghold in your life to where you arrange your life in a stronghold way uh, towards the things of God, Amen. being devoted to the Word of God, uh, being devoted to calling out to God in Amen. prayer, and being devoted to the people of God in the way that the Bible is commanded in a local fellowship, exhorting one another uh, through furthering the gospel of Christ. There's a big difference in someone who approaches life from that aspect and someone else who may be just as saved by the same grace and washed in the same blood, uh, but not have any interest in the things of God only going out after the flesh where there's no faithfulness to the Word, no faithfulness to prayer, no faithfulness to the people of God. Listen, if you can think of two examples today in your mind of folks that are either after the flesh or after the Spirit, you'll see the difference right off the bat. Yeah. There's a huge difference. Now last Sunday morning, I spoke to you about the diligence and the determination of, of the Spirit life, but also of the delights. And those delights were, we, after spiritual living, we delight in our adoption. 
We delight in our assurance of salvation and we delight in our affluence. That is that we're made heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And of course, that's joint heirs has to do with a conditional promise which has to do with glory later revealed when Christ comes the second time. Uh, those that will be faithful and serve Him will have to suffer now. Uh, there will be no crown wearing later if there's no cross bearing now. Amen. And uh, that's a Bible principle. And the message last Sunday was on groaning now and glory later. And from here in Romans chapter 8, I was able to show you the groanings of all creation spoken of there in verse 22. The groanings of the Christian spoken of in verse 23. And the groanings of our Comforter Himself in verse 26 and verse 27. As the Bible tells us that creation, all of it, is waiting for the curse of sin to be lifted. Amen. And for the glory of God to be manifest. Amen. And then of course the child of God groans within Himself. Waiting for the same. And the Holy Spirit of God who is the Spirit of our adoption. He too groans within us now. He is, he is helping us now, helping us in our weaknesses, but He's also waiting for the day when He will conclude that perfect work upon us and through us uh, as individual members of the body of Christ. And then as the church as a whole, it's going to be manifest that we're the sons of God. And with all that in mind, our text last week uh, involved these verses. If you'll look at verse 18, uh, it says, Therefore I reckon... Paul was a southerner, amen. <laughs> For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, as good as all that is, and it's wonderful, <coughs> look at our text this morning, beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And as I said there, what God's already graciously done for us in the work of salvation is only the beginning. It is wrong for us to treat salvation as if it's the end of something. It's the beginning of something. And what God has done is done for a purpose. Amen. Salvation is towards a purpose. It's the means to an end. And the purpose isn't just our being delivered from hell, although that's certainly good enough. That's not the end. It's the means to the end. God is working towards us being like His Son to the glory of His Son. That's the purpose of God. Amen. He wants you and me to be like Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what His purpose. Verse 29 says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Now notice, all this is as good as done. Yeah. Amen. God in His omniscience, He has seen the church. Amen. He has seen the body of Christ, a group of sinners that are delivered by the grace of God and washed clean in the blood of Jesus, sanctified and joined together by the Spirit of God. And those that He had that foreknowledge of, He predestined. Amen. Bible word. Right. We believe in predestination. Right. We just don't believe like John Calvin taught it. Right. But He predetermined that they would be made like under the glorious image of Jesus Christ. And then through the calling of God's salvation, we've been justified. I mean in the very process, once and for all, and yet there still remains that work of grace called glorification. We're going to be like Jesus. Amen. And all this is that truth. I mean, it's just amazing here. And it just seems as I can see Paul writing this by the Spirit of God, he's overwhelmed. 
As he records all this, he goes on the next few verses, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. According to these words that we just read in the Scriptures themselves, I mean the Word of God. We are in Christ. And there's the love of God that is towards us being in Christ through that spirit of adoption there. We're bound for certain glory and nothing. We just read it. Absolutely nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning what I want to preach to you with the help of God, I want to preach to you about the deed of spiritual living. The deed to spiritual living. We're talking about that claim, amen. Guaranteed glory. Amen. That's where we're headed. Amen. Now, you know, after you get saved, uh, uh, you, if, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are saved young. You may not understand this. You grew up with your friends in church and family members. they just always been in church with you. But there's some here that you came from a different background and you had some old friends that were friends of you in that old life and that old setting. And you get in a situation where you got some old friends and suddenly you get saved and you start wanting to go to church. You want to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. You start reading your Bible and after a while the Spirit of God begins work on you and says you ought to speak up. You ought to say something to your friends. And you start talking to them and they almost treat you as if who do you think you are? Who are you to talk to them? After all the things that you've been guilty of and all the things that's been in your life, who are you to even try to preach to them now? And if you're not careful, you'll feel that. Yeah, yeah. You'll feel that. It's important, amen, to have good friends. Amen. You know, some folks, that's as far as they'll go. Right. Just as soon as somebody slaps that on them, they'll, they'll clam up and quit growing and quit serving the Lord because they don't want anyone to think that they're trying to pretend that they're better than anybody, yeah. even though that's a false charge that's been leveled yeah. at their feet, and they'll still just, just shut up and not witness anymore. And some of them, you know what will happen? They'll grow on. And they'll get stronger and they'll get them some new friends. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Listen, if you've got a friend and he's not interested in helping you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not going to be a good friend. He's going to be a problem. He's going to be a hindrance to you. It's important to have good friends, young people. Old people. <laughs> it's important to have good friends. I don't know if you heard that story there about the two hunters in the woods and one of them clutched his heart and fell down to the ground. His friend panicked, couldn't tell if he's breathing, couldn't tell if he's alive, called on the cell phone. 911, he called him and said, uh, my friend, I think he just died. They said, well, calm down, calm down, make sure that he's dead. You hear a gun go off, boom. <laughs> said, now what? <laughs> you know, it can cost you having stupid friends. <laughs> you better have the right friends. But what I want to get across to you this morning is that you're staking a claim. You've got a right to speak up for Jesus Christ. You've got a right to start calling out all those old things of your old life. Changing some things about your life. If your friends don't like it, then you can just, you've got a right to get new friends. Staking a claim as a child of God, an heir of God, it's clear that we have a right to the future manifestation of the sons of God as children of God. We have a right to live right now, walking in a godly manner. The Bible even says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And you're not trying to pretend like you're any better than what you are just by seeking to be obedient and conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. The deed to spiritual living is our claim to having the assurance behind our salvation. The absolute guarantee of not only going to heaven, 
uh, but also being bound for glory as the sons of the living God, those of us who have the Lord Jesus, plain from the Scripture we just read this morning, we're saved and we're saved forever. Amen. That's a done deal. We're, we're not orphans in this world. Amen. We have a heavenly Father and He knows how to give good gifts unto His children. Amen. And He's worthy of all praise and honor. He's alive. He's omnipotent. Amen. He's immutable. He never changes. He said, I am the Lord. I'll change not. That's my Father. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. He's above all. There's none. There's none like Him. Our Father is a holy God who cannot lie and doesn't sin. And in Him there's no darkness whatsoever. Amen. That's our Father. Amen. And all glory is His. And through faith in Christ, we're heirs of God. And we're joint heirs with Christ. And we've been made to be partakers of His glory. One fellow said this, he said, why is it there's so many Christians that talk about our Father on Sunday go through the rest of the week acting like orphans? That's a good question. Amen. We that know the Lord as Father, having received the spirit of adoption, the Bible says He helps us cry, Abba, Father. The Bible says we're glory bound. And there's a lot to say about the believer and his connection to glory. But consider what we're talking about here. Just in the way of introduction, we're talking about the glory of God. The glory of God. It is to God's glory that His children enjoy and know His glory. That is to His glory. Over in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, David said, Thou, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. And the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven that is in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Amen. Whenever someone, you know, whenever uh, God bestows His glory, uh, you think about when God's glory filled the temple of Solomon. You know what had to happen? Everybody had to get out. <laughs> Amen. Even the priests got out. They got out, man, because they couldn't stand to minister in the presence of the glory of God. But now God, through the New Testament and the blood of Christ, He's made a new arrangement as New Testament priest, which is what every believer is. Yeah, we all have access to the throne. Yeah. We don't have to go through anyone. Amen. We've got a high yeah. priest that we, uh, we give answer to in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Yeah. And all of us are, by the blood, we're New Testament priests to the glory of God. And we're not excluded from God's glory. We're included in God's glory. David said the greatness and the power and the victory and the majesty and the glory all belong to the Lord. And God doesn't dispose of His glory in salvation. Rather, He exposes us to this glory in salvation. And for God to bestow His glory on His children upon the New Testament church, it is to the glory of God. He says in Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, Amen. neither my praise to graven images. Amen. That means God's not going to impart His glory to something or someone who takes away from His glory. Right. And by bestowing His glory to us, that magnifies His glory. Amen. The church is to the glory of God. Amen. The church is a body of redeemed people that exist to the glory of God. God is jealous for His own glory. So I was preaching Wednesday night. Jealousy is not petty insecurity. When it comes to God, that's not Him. It is frustrated righteousness. God is due our honor. He is due our praise. And He's jealous for it. He's jealous for His own glory and He's worthy of all honor and glory. Uh, but it is for God's glory, for His church and His children and us individual believers to walk and serve and rejoice in His glory. Speaking of the promotion that David experienced, speaking of himself, he said this, His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. And what David was simply doing there is he's just remembering. He's remembering where he was. A poor man on the backside of nowhere to a poor family keeping sheep for his father. Nobody even knew about him. That's where he was. And when God took him and made him the king over the nation there, David recognized that all this is the glory of God upon him. Amen. Psalm 64 verse 10, he said, The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in Him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. Psalms 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. God's glory is who He is. That's His glory. Amen. Who He is. That's the glory of God. His glory is His power. It's His mind. 
His glory is His riches and His grace. And He gives glory to those that trust Him. By We read in the Bible, Revelation 1, Revelation 5, promoting them to be kings and priests Amen. in His name. Think about that. And with Christ, He says in 1 Corinthians 2, we're going to judge the world. Right. Now, in our salvation, when we're saved, here we are just worthless sinners on our way to hell. And he gave that high price of the blood of Christ to redeem us from the penalty of sin and brought us in by His grace and mercy for His glory. And now He's promoted us through this, this operation of faith to holiness as priests, amen, to royalty as kings, and in wisdom as judges. Amen. Now what are we going to say about all this? I mean, it's like Paul. What are we going to say about this? I mean, it's overwhelming. It would be... It would be a sinful, amen, corrupt type of false humility for us to say, oh, well, I don't know about all that. Well, if you don't know about all that, then it's because you don't believe what it says. Right. And what it says is this is the, this is the way it's going to work, brother. I mean, the, the only thing we can do about it appropriately in reaction is to just humbly glory in it. Amen. I'm not saying any of us deserve anything God's ever done for us. Amen. But on the other side... I am saying God's done a lot for us. Amen. And there's a lot waiting us, amen, in His glory. And our glory is to be connected to His glory. That's the only thing we have to glory in. Is our God. The Bible says for a man to search out his own glory is not glory. Well, that's a fact. Shameful thing for a man to seek out and search for his own glory. Our glory is ordained of God to be unto His glory. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his body. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. No man can or should glory in his own wisdom in His own riches, in His own might, but His glory is to be done in the Lord. And we can glory in God's riches. We can glory in God's might. We can glory in God's wisdom. And as new creatures in Christ, God's own children, by our lives, the testimony we're to lead to this world, we're, we're, to, we're to testify of His glory in wisdom and how we conduct ourselves through prayer. People ought to realize, hey, there's something, these guys got a hold of something. Because they see the wisdom of God in our life. Hey, if you don't have it, God said, just ask me for it. Amen. And then to God's might and how we're overcomers. Things are going to happen in our lives just like it happens in everyone else's life. There are going to be problems. There are going to be challenges. There are going to be obstacles. But we're, we're to be overcomers. Amen. And that testifies to God's might in our life and God's strength in our life. And then it testifies to God's riches and our contentment and our joy and our, our thanksgiving. We ought to be satisfied. Amen. Like Jacob said, I have enough. Amen. I mean, this ought not be a rat race for us. The race ought to be over. We're in. Amen. Anything God gives me from here on out is grace. Amen. I ain't been cheated. I've been gloriously helped out. Amen. All glory belongs to God. But make no mistake about it, there is glory in being a Christian. And there is glory in living the Christian life. And there is glory coming for every child of God. We're glory bound. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Well, that, that light there, He says in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And it's just something there in Romans 8. He's wanting us to tie all this in with the spiritual life. The anticipation of glory. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause, for the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. you got to understand the world. Satan's the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
And he uses this world. He uses this world to get us off track. His end to us is our flesh. And through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, we keep falling in love with the world and then we end up spending all our time and all our might and all our efforts towards vain things and empty things. Why don't you turn to 1 Peter and get chapter 1. Hold your place in Romans 8. 1 Peter chapter 1. And, you know, girls, uh, as they come up, they're just by nature nurturers. Amen. They, they want to help someone. And that's a good thing. God put that in them. Amen. That'll make a good mother. Amen. When, when it comes to your children, you're a nurturer. I know mamas give, give, and give. Amen. That's the life of a mother. Just give and give some more. That's the life of a mother. But when you're choosing a husband, that ought not be your instinct. Looking for someone you can help. You understand? You won't end up marrying some bum that can't be helped. That's how, that's how the devil gets you. You understand? He knows how you're wired. And he knows, hey, there's something that girl wants to help something. So here comes some staggering bum that can't take care of himself. And she says, I'll fix him. And she can't fix him. Amen. He's a mess. He makes her life a mess. Yeah. Now you take a boy, you know what a boy wants? He wants to accomplish something. He wants to achieve something. God made something to that boy to, to get something done. To make his life count for something. You know what that boy wants? He wants to be great. Yeah. And you know how the devil messes up that boy? He uses the world to define to him what greatness is. Right. Yeah. And the world lies. Yeah. Yeah. And the world thinks because this guy's tall and big and strong and fast and rich and has talent as far as the world would reckon it, that he is great. And you look at who the world thinks is great, and really if you examine it all in the light of Scripture, it's laughable. Amen. They're not great at all. Amen. They're pitiful. Amen. Amen. Now, listen, I, I, I kicked a few of them this morning. Elvis Presley was a failure. Amen. I know some of you don't want to hear that in Tennessee. It doesn't matter, friend. If he's the king, what's he the king of? Yeah. <laughs> Immorality? Yeah. Immaturity? Yeah. Misery? Yeah. And so I believe Elvis was saved, but that he was one miserable saved man. Yeah. Yeah. Everything he tried in life touched a, touched a dung. Hey, listen, he was miserable as a poison dog. Yeah. That guy couldn't, he couldn't deal with himself at the That's end. Right. Yeah. You know why? Because if he was saved, he wasn't walking with the Lord. Yeah. And I don't know that he was saved, and you don't either. Right. I can name them all. Michael Jackson, great. He was a pedophile. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I mean, uh, we just go right down the list, name them, throw them out there. They're all immoral. Yeah. Weak, wicked, wayward. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's the criteria the world's looking for yeah. when they're trying to promote someone to greatness. And the fact is, friend, that the glory of man he uses that in opposition to the glory of God. Right. What we live for. Young men, listen, you want to do something great? Don't let the world tell you what greatness is. Yeah. Get your nose in that book. Right. Amen. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due season. He'll do something great with you. Amen. Amen. He will. But it won't be defined by the world's terms. Yeah. Here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, Notice what he says. He says, uh, verse, uh, verse 24, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord. Notice the contrast. One side, here's the glory of man. Over here is the word of God. And he says, The word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. See, it's a terrible trade-off whenever we're trading in what's real for that which isn't real. When we're trading in something that's eternal for something temporary. When we're trading in something that's glorious for something that's not. And that's the way this battle goes. So when it comes to glory, we've got to find a way as Christians to set ourselves apart and stay clean from the pollution of the world and all the things that stand opposite to true glory. The defilement, the vanity of the world works against the glory of God in our lives. Amen. There's a glory to be uh, revealed in the way of salvation. What a thing, amen, for someone to be saved by the grace of God. That's to the glory of His grace. Amen. And then His glory is involved in our walk with Him. 
and our service for Jesus Christ. And then there's the glory that's going to be revealed in us in the future. And the defilement and the vanity of the world threatens all that. And if we're led astray towards the corruption that's in the world to live worldly lives, wasting time, wasting our efforts, following after vanity, following after nothingness, that, that goes against the testimony of the Word of God and the true nature of God's salvation for our souls. Amen. We're bound for glory. Amen. God made us for His glory. Amen. Amen. It's not against His glory that He's bestowed His glory to us. Yeah. It's to His glory. Amen. That He has saved us and made us His church. Now, they got to see a difference. And if you're minding the same things they're minding, and your heart is only fixed on what their hearts are fixed on, amen, then they don't see a heavenly citizen. They don't see an ambassador of Jesus Christ. They don't see someone who's redeeming the time. They don't see someone there who's content, walking in love, governed in his life by the fear of God, motivated and driven by the love of Jesus Christ. All that gets snuffed out by the vanity of the world and the vanity of this life. And uh, every word, amen, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, that's what we need. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And looking here at still 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll notice Christians are born for glory. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again, there's the new birth, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. When you were born again, you were born for glory. Then also Christians are kept for glory. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice Christians right now are being prepared for glory. Verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be trod with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is what's waiting us, and we're being prepared for. But we can enjoy some of that glory now. Verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. That's right now, even through the process of manifold temptations and trials that is purifying your faith. He says in verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Go back to Romans chapter 8. And when you think about the sufferings of Christ, you think about Calvary, you think about His death there, that's His sufferings. When it talks about the glory that should follow, what is that? Well, real quick, one, the glory of His bodily resurrection followed that. Yeah. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, it's impossible for death to hold Him. That's a glorious fact. Amen. Then second of all, the glory of His heavenly ascension as He ascended back up to heaven in His own power and was seen by our witnesses. Amen. Third, there's the glory of His merited exaltation. He's given a name above every name. When He presented Himself to God the Father, God said, You sit right here at my right hand till I make all your enemies my footstool. Amen. That's to His glory. He merited that. Fourth, there's the glory of His high priesthood. Amen. He ever liveth to make intercession for the Amen. saints. Amen. And then fifth, the glory of His redeemed people, His church. Amen. Somebody looks at all these professing Christians and what a lot. I know there's some cream of the croppers out there, five-star believers, walking upright, doing it right, man. And you look at them and they're just marble people. There doesn't seem to be a flaw. But there's a lot of us down there on the bottom end. <laughs> We're just mutts. Amen. Amen. Just weak, known for weakness, known for waywardness, known for not having the plan, not having it figured out. And saved by the same grace, washed Amen. in the same blood. Amen. How is that group of people, how are they getting into heaven? By His death? Amen. By His blood? Amen. That's how. Amen. By His glory, that's how we're getting Amen. in. 
We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, not yeah. by us. Amen. We didn't do it. Amen. He did it. Amen. We trusted Him and Him alone. Then six, there's the glory that's going to be manifested in that church when He brings many sons to glory. One day, we're going to, you're going to be able to look at us and tell we're His. Right. He's going to change this vital body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. And then seventh, the glory of His earthly return and His universal reign and righteousness Amen. and peace as He's coming again back to earth Amen. and the church is coming with Him. If you're saved, you're going to be a part of His glory on display worldwide and every eye is going to see it. Now, folks, that's guaranteed. That's the message this morning. This is guaranteed what I'm preaching to you. Guaranteed glory. What we read about in Romans chapter 8 as it closes out, the Spirit of God is given to us. There's His work in us and through us and upon us. And the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with what awaits us. Nothing present. Not things now. Not things to come. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there's three things here. Three things, and I'll close. I'll just point out here at the end of Romans chapter 8 that shows this guarantee, all right? First off, it's guaranteed. This glory is guaranteed by the labor of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 31. He said, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Think about it, friends. What the nerve of these preachers who claim you've got to live it to give it. Amen. They're so far off. They're so, they miss it. Amen. They miss it so far off. Amen. You wonder if they even understand what salvation is. That, that's how important this matter of, of getting a hold of eternal security is. Amen. You're not going to heaven because you deserve it. You can never deserve it. Amen. You didn't get it in through the first installment payment. The Lord said, okay, I'm clearing the record. Don't mess it up. If that was it, there still wouldn't be anybody going to heaven. Amen. You'd mess it up. Amen. Amen. Think about what you've done since you've been saved. Amen. That's enough to send you to hell, enough to send me to hell forever. Thank God that's not the way that it works. Amen. And the nerve of these guys talking about, you know, well, they called upon the Lord, yeah, but they didn't keep their end of the bargain. So now they're going to hell? Well, Paul's statement here is, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? J. Bird? Yeah. It's God that justifieth. That J. Bird, that's in the original. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> you have to study the Greek to get that. His interest in us is revealed here. He has an interest in us. There's an interest. It says, if God be for us, Amen. who can be against us? Amen. Amen. It says plainly there, God is for us. Amen. There's an interest there in verse 31. And then in verse 32, there's His investment in us. As it says, He spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. There's an interest. There's an investment. Then there's His intentions. He says, how shall He not freely with Him give us all things? That's His intention. Folks, this is guaranteed glory because of the labor of Christ. And then second of all, we're guaranteed glory by the life of Christ. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Amen. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now the challenge here is made of the Scriptures themselves in the context of three reasons. While we know no one on earth has the right to condemn us who believe on Christ and declare, well, we're lost and we're condemned from hell, to hell from here on out. There's no one that can do that to me. There's no one that can do that to you if you've truly trusted Jesus Christ. There's no one that says, oh, hey, you went too far. I've heard them try to, try to deal with that. So somebody said they were saved, died, and there was booze in the car. You know I'm against booze. Amen. I'm against it. Amen. I'm against it. I don't think you ought to look at it. Amen. Amen. Let alone sip it. <coughs> but I'm going to tell you this. Just because you died in the car where it was present doesn't mean you go to hell. Right. Right. If you're saved, that means you're saved. Right. You say, well, they don't deserve to go. Neither do you. Amen. 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 We're all going unworthy <laughs> because He is worthy. Amen. Amen. To His grace, to the glory of His grace. Listen, three reasons why you know someone can't stand over you and say, well, he's lost now, she's lost now, and that is 
the price He paid on the cross. Amen. The power He displayed at the tomb Amen. and the position He holds at the throne. Amen. You can't overcome those things right there, brethren. Yeah. Right now, Jesus, amen, despite every jack leg preacher who tries to argue yeah. and condemn and go otherwise there, listen, it is His death that has secured our redemption. It is His bodily resurrection that has secured our justification and the position He holds at the throne. Here's what the Bible says. Let's not just try to figure this out. Hebrews 7.24 says, But this man, speaking of Christ, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Amen. He's go hey, as long as he's alive then, <laughs> we're covered. <laughs> Thank God. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things are unto you that you sin not. That's a good, honest motive. But then there's this part, if any man sin. <laughs> I'm glad there's that clause. <laughs> if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He said, well, I don't know if he did enough. Listen, he did enough for you. Yeah. Little old you, I don't care how dark Amen. and how desperate your sin was, he died for the sins of the world. Amen. He died for us all. And I say to you this morning, the captain of our salvation suffered. The Bible says that he might bring many sons unto glory, and it's guaranteed glory. It's secured by the labor of Christ. It's secured by the life of Jesus Christ. And then third, it's guaranteed glory secured by the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what we read. That we who are saved really are saved forever. He said, well, I know a preacher over here. He's a good man. He don't believe that. Well, I know a preacher over here. He's a good man. He, don't, he, he does believe it. Yeah. Well, how do we know? Well, let's just go with what the book says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just quit trying to figure out what's right by the good people that believe it. Because yeah, yeah. good people can get it wrong. Amen. That, book doesn't, that book always is right. Amen. And the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that's not descriptive of the, the, the act of Calvary where God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Amen. That was His act towards salvation and giving His Son. God came into this love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was the act of Calvary towards the world. That's not what's being described in Romans chapter 8. What's being described isn't the act of Calvary. What's being described is the relationship believers have with God. We're in Christ and nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a relationship being talked about. You say, someone says, well, yeah, of course He loves you. But you lose your salvation. <laughs> That's just the worst case of Bible handling you ever heard in your life. Lost people are in Christ Jesus. And nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. His love is enduring. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. His love to us is in Jesus. And folks, it's going to endure everything. It will endure anything. No matter what happens. No matter what could happen. His love endures. And then His love is enabling. Look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Amen. I don't ever have to worry about being lost ever again. I can stand flat-footed in, in any joint in this world. Look any sinner in the eye. I don't care what station of life they have, what office they occupy, what achievements this world has said that they've accomplished. doesn't matter. I can preach to them about Jesus Christ and Him coming into the world to save sinners. We're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We're enabled once we get a hold of this. And then His love, lastly, is everlasting. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When everything is added up and all these truths are digested here, it becomes clear. There's glory in this thing called Amen. salvation. <laughs> we, we've just tasted it. Amen. We missed hell. And that is wonderful. But there's the, the work of glory.
that's going on now and that one day will be completed when Jesus comes. The spirit of adoption. He's within us groaning, helping us right now in our infirmities. We're groaning within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the glory of God. Hebrews 6.19 says, Along the way, though, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. My hope is at the right hand of the Father. Amen. It's an anchor. Amen. I'm not drifting. Yeah. I don't have to. Amen. My security is my Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 33.27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. That's our God. You know, the first part of Exodus, God is getting Israel out of Egypt. The last part of Exodus, He's getting Egypt out of Israel. And it's a wonderful illustration and picture of salvation and our relationship with the Lord. But there at the Red Sea, that's a great visual of the miracle of being born again. Uh, a whole nation, by, by blood, the Passover lamb, and by power, the breath of God upon the Red Sea, they walk by faith on dry land, not touched by the waters of death and judgment. And they go to the other side, picturing the resurrection. And when the enemy pursued them down in there, God wiped out the threat against them. Amen. Folks, that's what salvation is. Yeah. Amen. God wiped out the threat against me Amen. when I believed on Jesus Christ. Now, is God still doing some work in me? Yeah, He's still trying to get Egypt out of me. Amen. Yeah. Still trying to get Egypt out of you. Amen. But the threat, it's gone. We've been washed in the blood. Amen. We've been sealed by the Spirit of God. And the glory that awaits us is guaranteed. Nothing, not things present and not things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And young folks and old folks alike, we are wasting our life chasing after the glory of the flesh and the yep. glory of this world, the glory of man. It's all grass and flowers, and it's here today, and it's gone tomorrow. Right. But the glory of God is eternal, and it's worth something. And we ought to live for that. I want to ask you to stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And as you're in prayer, I want to say this. If you're not saved, listen, if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, you die in your sins. You die in your sins, you know what? You're guaranteed damnation. It's guaranteed. God ain't going to weigh it out. He's not, you don't have a chance. But by the grace of God, you don't have a chance. The Bible describes you in he, uh, Ephesians 2 and says you are without hope if you're without Christ. He said, Preacher, what do I have to do? You need Jesus. And He's all you need. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And Christians, if you need to come and pray this morning, again, with some renewed zeal and renewed commitments and uh, some decisions that you're making for the Lord, you come and do that. But if you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be a pleasure and an honor to take this Bible and show you what the Gospel says. Show you how to be saved. You can have it book, chapter, and verse. You can get it in writing. Be glad to answer any question you have concerning salvation this morning. If you want to be saved, you come. You come. Every head bowed. Lord, thank you for your free gift of eternal life. And we pray, Lord, this morning, you'll bear witness to the truth that's been preached and help these, Lord, that have come. And, Lord, others that may need to come, we pray, God, if there's someone here that's never been saved, we pray for their soul, God. Help them to realize they're among friends. Help them to realize, Lord God, they're invited to come. They're not being presumptuous. Lord, I pray they'll understand today that they could be born again. They could be saved by your grace. Belong to your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. As you stand in prayer, and you begin to play.
Psalms 4, 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. The security we have as believers is absolute and it's eternal. And nothing will change it. We're saved and we're saved forever. But there will be different levels of glory for different believers. Again, if there's no cross bearing now, there's no crown wearing later. You want to be along for the ride or you want to be part of His glory? I guarantee you, if He puts a crown on any one of us sinners' heads and says, reign with me, it's to His glory. It testifies of His greatness. The more closer we live with Him and walk with Him and serve Him and bear His reproach and suffer with Him, the greater the glory. The greater the glory later. some time well spent. I appreciate you being faithful Sunday in, Sunday out. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Come praying if you would please. We'll dismiss the word prayer. Brother Ryan, if you would please.